Tim Ofte, the substitute against Bonner. Yes! Pat Bonner has saved it. Depending on the weather, uh, we would be out here most of, most of, most of our summer here. Uh, myself, Dennis and, and, and my dad, and uh, it was spent. Fishing, lobster, all different types of, uh, of fish, and uh, we used to catch by nets. And uh, we used to pull dulse, which was a seaweed, we used to pull it and then dry it and sell it. Uh, we used to cut seaweed uh, for the local factory, and uh, it was a great opportunity for us to, uh, to learn what the sea was all about. Um, something that a lot of kids never have the opportunity to do. Uh, now I come back every summer and uh, get a chance to get out here and, uh, and just get away from everything. I started off here in 1964 at New Campus School in 1965. What, what? what was the date I came to school now? There you are there, the 10th to the 5th, 65. You yeah, know, and, a few uh, years ago, eh? A few years ago. You were, a lot of waters passed under the bridge. You were, you were, we were almost five when you came here. And yes. of course, the, uh, if you look over there, you'll see your attendance. Uh, how was it now? Was it good or bad? It was very good, with exceptions of one year there. Oh, where I, you were down when I broke my arm. You broke your arm. Yeah, that's when correct. I was uh, pampered at home and uh, my mum looked after me. Spoiled, you see, when everybody else Yeah, well, it's, it happened at the end of the month of September. Yeah. And, uh, of course, the story is now told that you were uh, on the way to being a goalkeeper at that stage <laughs> and you were up on top of a rock. Don't believe you know, Jumping off. Dennis claims that he could <laughs> score goals too easily when you were in the grounds with you, but you're up on the top of the rock to beat you. Uh, we had a, a priest, uh, Father Con Cunningham, who uh, really was the first guy to start organised football. What he used to do is bring a, a group of kids, uh, I think he had about 14 or 15, and he used to jam them all into his own car and bring them over here and really set up a match and we would play them. And they used to be cracking matches, you know. We were only probably about 10 years old at that time, and even less, and uh, that was the first organised football. There was one particular occasion when I was in Fanid and I went up one day to support the Milford team against the Rosses in the final at the Milford Convent. And Mickey Ferry, who was a very, very good footballer and played with uh, some of the good teams since Indeed, around, uh, yeah, Mickey well. was taking a penalty at that match and you were in the goals. And I remember telling a story often since. Not only did you stop the penalty, but you held it. <laughs> and I said, that boy's going to be good. Well, this is where we started off playing really competitive football uh, for, for a team in a competitive league. And uh, we started off here with a, an under-16 team. And uh, we won a few things. We won the, the league. And uh, when we showed that we were decent players, we got into their senior team. And then we, we had a great team then. And we went on to win the league here in the Cup. And uh, unfortunately, around here, it's very difficult to get noticed. Uh, you're not in the city. Uh, and I was lucky to get into the Irish youth team, but uh, the rest of the lads that played with me were very, very good players. And I'm sure if they played in, in Glasgow, um, they might have an opportunity to go on to play professional football. When I got a little bit older, uh, I played in goals, of course, in soccer. And uh, when you're playing goals all the time, you, at times you think, oh, I wish I was out there scoring the goals and uh, kicking the ball about out in the middle of the park. Gaelic football gave me that opportunity. Uh, I played in the middle of the park, uh, right up to senior level. And, uh, it helped my fitness and uh, it also made me nice and tough for what lie ahead in, in Scotland. Uh, so I really enjoyed that because it gave me a, really a break from, uh, from soccer and both games complemented each other. 
I was playing with the Irish youth team and uh, we were getting together in Dublin and we were heading off to Finland um, to play a game. So we had a little practice match before we went away and Sean Fallon, who was the chief scout with Celtic at that particular time, um, was over watching games in the League of Ireland and he came along to watch our game. So we met uh, the team, he was flying back to Glasgow the next morning and we were flying off to Finland and he met the team there and uh, uh, he was talking to me and he asked me would I like to go on trial um, and I said of course, I'd be delighted to and uh, he says well I'll get in touch with your manager and he asked the name of the manager uh, and uh, I passed it on to him and I came back from that and I was here in, at home doing the usual uh, at school and so on and uh, next thing our manager Maz McCall told me that Sean had written to him asking me over for a trial and I went over there in November 1977 and that was the first time I stepped into Celtic Park. Now um, I look back and, and I knew I didn't appreciate it as much as I should have. Um, first year, um, it was a, an expectation of everybody to win things at that time. Now when we're not winning things, uh, you look back and say, I wish I, wish I had uh, appreciated that a little bit more. But I, I did appreciate it. Uh, and uh, I knew that um, you know my career was heading in the right direction. Uh, there was times, of course, in that particular year that uh, Billy McNeil could have dropped me and probably should have dropped me. Uh, but because we were winning, he stuck by me, and uh, you need that breathing space at times, and certainly uh, he gave it to me. McGrain. While David Proven looked up, watched McLeod drifting forward in the headers for a great goal. Hesitation by Reed. This is Stunnock looking for someone to drink. This is Mill, and now Pedic has done it, the equaliser. On a curl and that's a neat touch in the center. Mugabe with the final touch. Reads wide in the left. Buns was screaming for a good run by Buns. Must put it away, it does. Ball swelling a bit. Willie Pettigrew's a neat touch and Bon has done it, no, it's there. Stun up. I doubt very much if anybody in that crowd has felt the intense cold here tonight. Celtic could play 54 games, 126 and only lost five. We had a good team at that time. Uh, we, we had the previous experience of the year before, uh, which stood us in very good stead for what it was, what it was a hard season. And um, it was down to the last game, which I said, and uh, we were playing St Mirren at Parkhead, a capacity crowd. If we lost the game and Aberdeen won their game and they were actually playing Rangers that particular day uh, and if they had a one by four goals they would have pipped us for the championship. We went in at half time and it was nil nil and uh, the score filtered through from Pitaudry that uh, Aberdeen was winning four nil. Uh, the manager tried to keep it uh, from us, the score from us, a few, I think a few of the senior players heard it, didn't pass it on to the younger lads like ourselves. Um, we went out and we won the game and uh, Tommy Burns and George McCluskey scored in that game. Will he start playing it back to Fitzpatrick and he's caught out by McLeod. Kenny wants it out in the right. But his aim for Burns, now McCluskey. Oh, that's a great goal from Celtic. George McCluskey. McAdam got a free header. Now his goal is given. Yes, the goal is given. Lovely touch again from Burns. Now McCluskey, and that really clinches it all. Great move again from Celtic. The cup was a little bit of a bogey for us, maybe because we put all our concentration on the league and the cup ran away from us and we got beaten vital games. We all seemed to draw Aberdeen to around that time in, in the cup, you know. Uh, but we had our league cup success against Rangers and uh, because it was Rangers it was extra special for, for all of us, especially for us young guys, to go out and win a cup final against uh, the old enemy 
uh, special in your career and uh, I think it was our first cup final against Rangers like myself and Charlie and Mark Reed and people like that uh, so that was a special day for us yeah now Proven inside it goes and Nicholas does it again 22 minutes gone Charlie Nicholas gives Celtic the lead right out of the blue Robin's corner kick, here's Aiken. Robin came back to stay onside. Right across the far side, McAdam is there. McKinnon very determined. Vintage goal from Mother McLeod. Jim Betts scored from a free kick. Not a great goal in my, my eyes for me, but a good goal I suppose for Jim Bett. Um, but it put us under a little bit of pressure and uh, it was a nail-biting thing right up to the fi final whistle. Here's Malpens. Oh, should have done that better. David Dodds. There's a shot he scored. It's a reverse pass, and Aiken is up there, as he said. Here's the shot I expected. Free kick, and this could be very interesting. There's Hamish McAlpin. And only twice in the history of the Scottish Cup have goals been scored direct from a free kick. Is this a bit of history? It is! David Crowley! Garvey. Hegarty. Here's Aiken. Good drifting ball, it's there, McGarvey! Fourteen minutes to go, David Proven scored equaliser, um, a lovely free kick uh, to put us on the, on the road again and really I don't think there was going to be any, winner, any, any other winner than Celtic after that and uh, Frank McGarvey scored uh, with not too long left, a uh, diving header which was uh, a great occasion for, for me anyway because it was my first cup, Scottish Cup win and as I said to walk up those stairs at Hamden and lift a trophy and a medal which is important, that's the one you hold on to, uh, is, is a great occasion. I think Celtic, or Rangers for that matter, um, are the only teams capable of doing what we did that year and catching a team. We kept plugging away, I think we went that particular year, but 13 matches unbeaten near the end of the season uh, under Davy Hay. And, uh, uh, we, we felt that if we could get a good run going that uh, we maybe had a chance especially we were watching the results that, that Hearts were having and they were stuttering and we felt keep it going here we have a chance and it certainly worked out that day that particular day uh, the last day of the season the season that um, we played St Mern at Love Street and Hearts were playing Dundee uh, up at Dens Park and uh, it was an unforgettable day in, in our eyes because the championship was all about that day and Hearts only had to win the game uh, we were playing in the game and we played magnificently that day. And a great header by Brian McClear. McClear doing well, wrinkling the ball free to McStay. Here's Mo Johnston. It's there. In full cry now as McClear gets free on the right. Here's Johnston. Absolutely magnificent. Celtic are certainly playing like champions. Lars Deacon testing Tom Wilson. Makes his way to the byline. Here's Bottom McLeod now. McStay. Someone trying to play Celtic offside. We failed. Here's Johnston. Now Bottom McLeod. McLeod. We got the news near the end of the game. We had started to filter through on the crowd and the terracing that Dundee had scored. And. Uh, there was a couple of different cheers went up right around the stadium. We didn't know what really was happening. And uh, there was an almighty cheer when the second goal went in. And uh, then I sort of turned behind me and, and asked some of the crowd what was happening. And they were more or less giving the score that uh, Dundee was winning 2-0. Now that must be a goal for Dundee. Sheer bedlam around the stadium. Uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't really expect them to, to lose it 
although we had to, and for the sake of the fans and sake of everybody concerned, that we had a battle to the end. And uh, that's what our amazing fans is all about. Uh, we had to go out and try and compete with Rangers. Uh, we knew that the players knew that we, we were as good as as the Rangers players if we buckled down to it. Uh, we were given a sort of a new system by the management to adapt to, and we had players like Tommy Barnes, Roy Aiken, Billy Stark was brought in, all very experienced players who wanted to do well and wanted to uh, to make uh, sort of something happen in this particular year, especially because it's been our our centenary year, a very very important year in, in the club's history. McAvenny. That's Rogan! It must be a great chance! Must be yes! Morris! Try to swing it round, that's a very good ball. Walker has done it! What a fine goal! Walker again. Oh. And then it goes. Celtic are the champions. And on to the field come all the youngsters who have been skirting the ground. And the players have to go off. Uh, that particular week, uh, we. Um uh, I, I started training on a Tuesday and suddenly uh, my calf seized up. I was getting a little bit of problems with my, uh, with my uh, sciatic nerve down the side of my leg. Uh, not that I thought it was my sciatic nerve, I thought it was my hamstring that was giving me a little bit of problem. Uh, but my calf seized up and uh, I worked all week trying to get it right and suddenly I couldn't, on that particular morning we had a fitness test and unfortunately I had a yes, admit defeat. That must have been a huge disappointment. Oh, especially it being been the double winning year and we were going for our double and uh, I remember waking up that morning, it was a gorgeous morning and uh, I went out for my fitness test and I ended up uh, down by the wall having a good cry to myself. Now, the Irish setup was not successful in the early 80s, and on the own hand, you only had a couple of opportunities to prove yourself. Did you feel that you were never going to break through? Was it a frustrating time? Yes, very frustrating. When you go abroad and you're picking a squad, and uh, especially myself, because I, I was the only uh, Irish player playing in the Scottish League, and uh, you, you went. Uh, with the team and uh, at times you didn't feel part of it because you weren't playing you couldn't you, you know and again the, the the question that came across was was I not um, good enough because I played in Scotland and did the, the, the other players think that too you know and those were the questions I was asking asking but uh, 
so it was a very very frustrating time, uh, you know, and, and uh, I was a little bit disillusioned with it all, you know. But I, st I, st I stuck in there, and uh, that was important. And I got to know all the players uh, over a, a lot of seasons. And uh, now I think that in itself has, has, has helped me to get where I am today. Well, when I took the job and I first picked the side, the two goalkeepers available to me were Paddy Bonner and, and Jerry Payton. And we went to Iceland and we gave them both a game. And, uh, and Paddy came through in the successful games and he stayed as the number one goalkeeper. Jerry, unfortunately, has sort of trailed along behind him ever since because Paddy has played so well and so consistently that uh, it's, you've never been able to, to say, look, I'm going to try the other goalkeeper. So Jerry's been, had a sit on the bench and twiddle his thumbs for uh, nearly five years. Yeah, we got a couple of days off and I uh, decided instead of going back to Glasgow, I think I wanted to come down here and sort of clear my head more than anything else. Uh, and I came down here for a day and uh, came about and walked, walked all around here and uh, there's nobody about here and, uh, and, and uh, you can walk for miles along the beach and just think and uh, get yourself psyched up for what lay, uh, what lay ahead uh, and that was, that, was, that was very important to me at that stage. Right to Waddle. Beardsley. And Lineker, and back for Robson. Good stop by Pat Bonner, and he earned his corn there. That was a most important save from the Celtic keeper, and when he was called upon, he did it. Good build up. Robson lethal in those positions. He stopped it, and what's more, he was there to hold it. We knew that we could beat them. Um... We went out, we got a goal, Ray Houghton scored a goal early on in the game, which settled us down and uh, the Irish support we had with us that particular uh, time was amazing. Uh, they went for a holiday first and foremost uh, with the games as a bonus uh, and the result then was an added bonus and it made a holiday for them. Uh, but uh, they went absolutely crazy when we, when we scored that goal. All right, Stevens together, Galvin pulling it across. Miss kick by Sansom, in goes Aldridge, and Houghton! 1-0! And uh, the whole way through then, the game uh, unfolded. It was very, very warm that day, I remember, and uh, the way we pressurised him, was, um, the heat didn't help us that particular day, and later on they brought on Glenn Hoddle, uh, who's a tremendous passer of the ball, 
and uh, he started to stroke a few great passes onto Gary Lineker and uh, then I had to earn my uh, corn and uh, I made good saves, there were some of them very lucky and I think if Gary Lineker had the opportunities again uh, against me, the, the same amount of opportunities, I think he probably would have scored maybe a couple of goals but uh, I saved them and uh, I think la la right on the la final whistle they got a free kick out on our right hand side and uh, uh, Glenn Hoddle took the free kick and knocked it into the middle of the goals and uh, I was going to go for it, uh, changed my mind, got back onto my line and Gary Lineker got a header in and uh, I managed to do a free re reflex save and just touch it onto the post and round. Glenn Hoddle to take the free kick. And Lineker and Bonner did it again. And that was the last kick of the game, and then we knew the game was over. And it was celebrations from then on in. And now the referee looks at the watch and blows his whistle. And the Irish are at the top of the table. Unbelievable moments in the Necker Stadium. The whole of Ireland rejoice at a victory that we scarcely believed would come to pass. We should have won the game. That was the one game I think that we played very, very well, and and everybody back home says I think it was the best we've played uh, since Jack took over at that stage. But we drew one each. Uh, Protestant have scored for them, and uh, we were disappointed. You know, Ronnie Whelan in that particular game scored one of the best goals he ever scored in his career. Yeah, I, uh, I felt a little bit on on my back when I was kicking the ball out because I was putting, trying to put extra. Uh, pressure and, and strength into it uh, because we, we'd like to play the ball as far forward as we can and play from there and I felt a little bit uh, but I, I got through the game no problem and then I woke up on the Thursday morning and I could hardly bend down I was so stiff and oh, that was me I felt that's my back away gone completely uh, but uh, again Mick worked on it uh, but it wasn't right up till up till probably two hours before the game that I felt that I could play and I told Jack um, in the morning of the Holland match that Jack, I'm, I'm struggling here, I can't play. Uh, and uh, at that stage, he was in his room trying to take socks out of his case. And he looked up at me and he says, Listen, you're playing. If you don't play, you'll be letting everybody down. It was a way probably of saying, Listen, come on, you know, get out there and try it anyway, you know. Um, until I got to the, got to the match, uh, I was still very, very, very stiff, but Mick worked on me, massaged me, stretched me, and by the time that I was going out to play the game, I, uh, I was fine. Uh, I wouldn't say fine, but I was, I was good enough to play. So it just shows you, if Jack hadn't said that to me, I probably would have sat out the match and missed out on a great occasion. The Dutch playing the composed kind of game we might have expected them to play, but of course they are lightning sharp on the break. There's a shot that Bonner does well to throw away. And in goes McGrath! Stopped at the line! Aldridge is there, whistle's gone, whistle's gone. And McCarthy was in some trouble, but now it's Van Basten and Bonner in just the right place. And it's now Van Basten and played to Muren and back towards Voters. And Bonner, acrobatic but effective. They were a great team at that stage. Rudy Gullet, Van Basten up front, uh, they were in their prime, you could say, at that stage. And uh, they had a tremendous team and uh, played some great football. That day we were under pressure, but uh, really we thought we were going to get a result and we needed a draw to qualify. And there was only about eight minutes left that they got a, a goal from uh, Van Kieft. It was really a, a wicked uh, bounce of a ball that beat us, you know. When you came back to Dublin, anybody watching would have thought you'd won the European Championship. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, we didn't know, we, we thought we were coming back and we were probably a little celebration back in Dublin. Uh, we got back and the streets were lined with people, you know, as if we won the European Championships. And uh, Jack common, commented after the game, he, he uh, said, what would, what would happen if we won something here, you know? had to play Rangers in the cup final at Hamden, which was obviously a fantastic occasion. Uh, as I said before, all cup finals are great occasions, but uh, especially when you play the old firm, it makes it that 
a little bit extra special and uh, we played them and uh, the goal came from a, a mistake which probably won most of most games against Rangers a uh, mistake um, by Gary Stevens and Joe Miller pounced on it and scored the goal for us uh, then it was sort of a back to the wall for a wee while and under pressure but we stormed and we came through and we won the game and uh, yes it was very very vital that we, we won a, um, a cup that year for, for the Celtic fans Here's Peter Grant that's intended for Joe Miller a great interception by Goff Stevens in trouble there's Joe Miller four minutes from half time celebrations Here's Walters, good flowing move this from Rangers. Fine cross and excellent goalkeeping by Bonner. So it's Sunis and Ian Ferguson holding the midfield now for Rangers with Walters and Cooper wide on the flanks. Here's Joe Miller with Aiken. That's for Miller again, no offside flag. Back it goes to Aiken. The far post it goes, there goes Buns! Off the line by Stevens. of the Celtic fans. Well, if ever the pressure was in Celtic, it was earlier in 1991 when uh, you were looking for a hat-trick of defeats of Rangers in the Cup. Yes, uh, again, it was a vital vital time of the season for us. Um, if we had to get beaten that game, we would have nothing to look forward to and it would have been a disaster, really, for, for Celtic. And we knew that we had to try and prove to everybody that we could match Rangers. So Haitley incensed there about being penalised for the foul. Challenging Derek White in the air unfairly in the eyes of referee Waddle. The referee handling his first Old Firm match. Well, one thing's for sure, Jock, we won't get a free header when Mark Haley's around, that's for sure. Coin going to touch this, Craney! <laughs> Celtic are ahead! It's Jerry Craney in the sixth minute of the match. Absolutely a brilliant goal by Craney. A brilliant leap by Tommy Coyne under pressure from Richard Goff, but Craney's made a run just off shot there and fired an unstoppable volley. Collins made the tackle on Walters. There's Paul McStay looking for Craney forward. Out of the retreat from this bit. Harlock is penalised. It's a dub check with the free kick. That's well struck and deflected! 2-0 to Celtic! Darius Dubček takes the credit with the help of a deflection that appeared to come off Terry Harlock. Bad love here at Celtic Park. 37 minutes of the first half gone. 2-0 to Celtic. And here's the effort from Darius Dubček thundering the ball forward. That appeared to come off Terry Harlock, and once again, Chris Woods had no chance of stopping that. It was a thumping strike by Dubček. I think uh, Chris Woods probably had it covered, and the deflection just, a wicked deflection, just took it out of the reach of Chris Woods. It's 2 0 to Celtic, and time is rapidly running out. Richard Goff has pushed forward to join the attack. It's all or nothing now for Rangers. Austra. Plays that to the near post, but it's stopped by Bonner. Well, Graham Sinners chewing his gum there, looking very solemn as you would expect. In a very unhappy Scottish Cup occasion once again for the Rangers manager. Yeah, I think we matured after the European Championships. Um, we, we started to uh, develop as a team. And uh, we had a very, very tough section, uh, but we came out with flying colours in it. We lost probably a, a bad goal early on in the game. Um, we thought the ball was out over the line, and if you see it on film, it, it certainly looked that way. And we stopped playing. Uh, and uh, when you give opportunity to uh, Chris Waddle to uh, have time on the ball and put in good crosses, uh, which he did, and right into Gary Lineker's path, although he uh, tried to do something with the ball and it worked the other way and, and he scored a goal. Uh, but that's the rub the green. And 
they scored. So we were under pressure, but we fought back again. We showed character and resilience, uh, and, and we got back there, and uh, we, we got a great goal from Kevin Sheedy. And Sheedy, good man to tidy. Oh, Sheedy's there again, and Sheedy shoots! Oh, one one Kevin Sheedy! A magnificent goal, a moment of inspiration from the Everton midfielder. It was always going to take something of that order to bring Ireland back into the game. And it was Kevin Sheedy's determination that took him through and rifled it wide of Shilton. McMahon caught out, in went Sheedy, and that is the equalising goal. To play Egypt uh, in, in the World Cup and not beat them was very disappointing. Uh, but they just sat back and they frustrated us. And, uh, but it was again a learning process. We've never come up against that before. Uh, and. Uh, Maybe the next time we play a team like that on a similar occasion, then we, we, we would be able to do better against them. But uh, we weren't out of it at that stage. Uh, we went on to play a Holland then in the final game and down in uh, Sicily, and that was a tremendous occasion. Uh, um, we had played Holland before, and we knew uh, that uh, we were going to have a, have a game on our hands, but we were ready for them. And Jack was very, very confident we would beat them. He felt that Rudy Gullard and Van Basten weren't playing as well. They had a lot of trouble in their camp also at that stage, and they weren't a team that they were two years previously. I think the first 20 minutes of that particular game, I think it was the best I've seen Holland play. Uh, you couldn't actually see it properly on TV because uh, they, they had the ball at the back and they were knocking it about. But up front, they were making unbelievable runs all over the place. But we were putting them under pressure on the ball, which is Jack's philosophy again. And uh, they weren't allowed to knock that killer ball. They had, couldn't get their heads up to see where the, where the movement was up front. Uh, but as a defender uh, and a goalkeeper, uh, you were under severe pressure trying to match the runs and watching and shouting and making sure that everybody was picking up. And it was very, very difficult. But then they couldn't do that for the whole game. Uh, they scored. And it was a bad goal. We turned our backs in a free kick, which is criminal at the international level, and really good at scoring. It was a fine goal, but uh, uh, we we felt, listen, let's get up here and get at them, you know, and let's get uh, this battling spirit in here and uh, get at them again. And uh, we scored from Niall Quinn, uh, a long kick out with myself, which was badly cleared, and a little bit of a fumble by the goalkeeper Van Brooklyn. And but Niall was there to pounce on it. Pat Butters, big clearance down the middle. Cascarino was after it. There was a blunder by Berry Van Arle. Van Breukelen compounded the error. And there was Niall Quinn to score what could prove the most important goal in the history of Irish soccer. But up until that game, um, I had very little to do in, in the World Cup, you know. And I felt, I remember uh, sitting back thinking about it and saying, I wish I could get a little bit more to do here to contribute to the to the success we're having, you know. Uh, not that I was selfish or anything, but uh, I just uh, felt that, you know, this could bypass me and suddenly have nothing to do. And the re remaining game was ideal for me. It was uh, uh, five o'clock in the afternoon. It was just the sun was going down. It was still very, very warm. Uh, and of course, they had the player in Hadji, uh, Giorgio Hadji, which uh, certainly he was a great player. And uh, he uh, cut us apart a little, uh, a few times. And uh, I had to make good saves from him. Balint, and Balint again, and once more Bonner to the rescue. Romania's corner with Hadji. Raduchoyu, and Bonner making the save. It's Hadji. The shot, oh, saved by Bonner. And he can scarcely believe it. The penalty, the penalty shoot out itself was, it was, um was the sort of stage that I wanted, you know, and uh, there was no pressure under on on me at all. Uh, uh, you know, goalkeepers if they save the penalty, they're heroes. If they let it in, they're expected or the the, the takers expected to score. So there was no pressure on under whatsoever. And the way it was working out, that uh, I was getting close to each one, and I felt, you know, the next one's going to be the one, you know. He's guessed right each time. Oh, and he so nearly got there, Pat Bonner. I remember looking into the crowd and actually seeing one guy from Dunlow here, and uh, that was fantastic. It gave me, you know, he gave me a sort of a wave, and I said, "Next one, you know." Uh, but it, it cheered me up, you know, and uh, uh, I said I got myself psyched up for, for this particular penalty. And uh, the player himself, Tom Ofte, uh, I feel very, very sorry for anybody that, that misses a penalty. But uh, when he came up to the ball, he he uh, 
he stood at a very severe angle to the ball and I felt if he's going to side foot this ball he's going to knock it wide on my left hand side and there's only one place this is going to go is going to go into my right hand side fortunately for me he had it with enough pace that I could get there and uh, it was just about a yard off the, off the ground which was the ideal spot for me to make the save but I read him, read him well uh, in fact myself and Jerry Payton the other goalkeeper had talked about this scenario uh, the night before in our room and we, we, we lie there and uh, Jerry gave me a little few hints of what he does at penalties and I spoke to him what I do and we put the two together and we come up with a winning combination. Romania's last penalty. Tim Ofte, the substitute against Bonner. Yes! Pat Bonner has saved it. And Ireland can now win this tie in the penalty shootout. The big man from Donegal has set it up for the victory, and Jack Charlton knows it well. David O'Leary against Silvio Lung. This kick can decide it all. The nation holds its breath. Yes! We're there! David O'Leary has done it! I could, I could just think about my own wife and family at home and what they were go feeling about it all, and glued to the television, and, and the people back here in, uh, in Donegal and Ireland. And we had some of the tape sent out from RTA who needed some coverage of what was happening back here in this country, and the whole place was going crazy, you know. And uh, uh, before the Holland match, uh, we, we watched the tape, and they had part of my family on it and all that, and the excitement back home. And I knew that, uh, you know, this was the moment for, for them all. And uh, we sat back, and uh, I must admit the tears were rolling down the face uh, afterwards. Everybody was, you know, and Mick Bourne was in hugging everybody, and uh, it was it was a super occasion. It's something that you remember for the rest of your life. He, uh, we had a private audience with him then, and uh, when he when he came up to us, uh, Mick McCarthy, Mick Bourne, and Jack presented him with a ball in the jersey, uh, probably playing with it just now, out the back of the Vatican. Uh, but he, um, he came along the line then, shook a few hands, and uh, when he came to me, uh, somebody mentioned to him that I was the portier, which is the goalkeeper in Italian, and he said, oh, portier. Uh, and he uh, smiled and put his hand on my shoulder and shook my hand. And it was lovely. Uh, he was a, a goalkeeper himself, and he lived in Poland um, when, he, when he was a youngster, so obviously he had a bit of affinity with the goalkeepers. Was the Italy game therefore a bit of a letdown, or did you really expect to go out in the quarter-final stage against the host nation? Uh, no, we didn't expect to go out because, again, with Jack Charlton behind us, Jack, you see, the great thing about Jack, he went through the whole thing before with England, and he won the thing, which was great to have somebody like that behind you and encouraging you and telling you that you can do it. And Jack was very, very confident against Italy. He had watched Italy, and he... Uh, he told us that Italy was the ideal team to play for us uh, because of the system they play and the system we play to, to stop them their system working. And uh, uh, Jack um, was very, very confident and, he, and that got across to the players, you know. McCarthy with the throw. Off the chest of Aldridge. McGrath. Quinn! Oh, great stop by Zenga! Beating Townsend. Scilacci, Giannini, now Donadoni. Oh, what a shot! Scilacci, and it's there! And Italy have taken the lead! When Donadoni hit the shot, uh, he had a tremendous power, and uh, I went to move to my right to make the save or guide it past the post or whatever, and suddenly the ball moved back inside, and uh, it really moved about two yards in the air. And uh, my body weight and everything connected with me was going to my right. The ball ended up on my left hand shoulder, and I tried, I couldn't try and catch it because I wouldn't be able to. And I tried to pull it away from the danger zone and pull it to my right hand side with me as I was falling. Uh, unfortunately, Scalacci was sitting there, and uh, anything that came to Scalacci in that particular tournament, he stuck in the net. The final whistle has sounded, and Ireland go out. But the relief among the Italians is plain for all to see. They have had a match and a half. What was the feeling at the end of the World Cup tournament? Relief that it, all the pressure was over? Or tremendous pride that you'd gone that far? Oh, I think pride. Pride uh, above all and satisfaction that uh, here we are, we are going in to play against the best teams in the world, against the best players, and we came out with our he heads held high. Uh, nobody gave us a chance. Um, 
we didn't have a lot of uh, probably uh, optimism ourselves, uh, but we got there and we went out and gave it our best whack, and uh, and certainly uh, we, uh, we we were overjoyed with the way it went. And when you came back to Carrick Finn, the scenes were unbelievable. Yes, we came into Dublin first, and uh, the crowd was big for the European Championships uh, when we returned from there. But uh, this was probably about 500,000 people packed into a corner street in Dublin. It was frightening at times, to be honest. Uh, the kids were getting a little bit squashed, something I didn't like. But uh, we, we knew that uh, the country was so proud and so uh, so proud of, of really the, the name Ireland again, you know. Um, you couldn't, you know, people wouldn't buy things like green t-shirts or uh, things with shamrocks on them in, in the older days. Uh, suddenly you couldn't, you couldn't buy them during the World Cup. They were sold out completely, people made a fortune on them. Uh, but that was the pride thing again. And uh, even now when I come back into Ireland uh, a year later, all the kids are still wearing their uh, World Cup t-shirts and their Irish strips. And it's lovely to see there's so many kids now playing soccer here in this country. Uh, and it's just down to the World Cup. Um, before they used to call themselves the Maradonas and um, the Pelés and all this of, of world soccer. Now they're calling themselves the John Aldridge's and Packy Boners maybe. So that's that's lovely, and it's lovely to be appreciated by your own people in your own in your own country. Welcome to a great celebration here at the Albany tonight, and a record-breaking evening. We go into the Guinness Book of Records. It's 920. A record here for Pat Bonner. Since he came out of the Celtic side, he's been a, a very popular goalkeeper. He's always been known as one of the best since he was like as early as 18, 19 years old. So he's been playing now for 13 years at the top level, which is a standard that's very hard to achieve. And uh, that in itself speaks volumes for, for him as a person and as a goalkeeper. And I think he's proved time and time again, playing for Celtic, playing for Ireland and playing against the best teams in the world. He has number one. It took me about six years to understand what he was actually shouting from the goal mouth. But uh, he said in his speech earlier on tonight, it took him a long time to earn respect, and he did that simply through his ability. I've never seen anybody who had the capacity to, to work on the training ground the way he had, and he deserves everything he's achieved in the game. Fabulous goalkeeper. For a big man, he's, he's six foot. You get a lot of the big boys that can't jump, and Pat Bonner can come and jump, and when he comes to the balls, he looks he's 10 feet high. And, uh, very impressed. I'm delighted that he's chosen his future with Celtic because Packy, as far as I'm concerned, epitomises the best of our club. He comes from Ireland, he comes from a, a place that we know supports us and loves us. He, he shows his appetite, he shows his love of the club, he shows his determination to succeed and to do well. Like myself, he has, he has stated openly that it's a privilege to play for the club. To be perfectly frank with you, I think it's been a privilege for us at Celtic Park to have Packy Bono to play for us. My career has uh, stemmed 13 years and uh, each year as you go along something new happens, something better happens and this is the climax so far. Uh, to have an aid like us here in Glasgow by, uh, and uh, by really laid on by the Celtic supporters, it's, uh, it's a lovely feeling. And now you'll be looking forward to the, the next great event, uh, Celtic versus the Republic of Ireland. Yes, um, we'll get a day to organise and uh, I know all the Irish boys when I spoke to them about it were really looking forward to it and uh, some guys like Ray Houghton who were Celtic supporters when they were kids and that, they would love to come back here and play at Celtic Park and of course play for the Irish team. What a gala occasion that will be. start your career uh, you don't look at records uh, you just go out there to enjoy playing football to do it to the best of your ability and uh, suddenly things happen records um, become evident uh, as long depending on the many years you play and so on and suddenly they come about and uh, it's great to get them uh, and uh, I'm delighted that, uh, that now I'm the most capped uh, goalkeeper in Ireland and I've played over 500 matches with 
with Celtic and uh, lovely things to think back on. A lot of people have played professional football never really had the opportunity to do that. So a tremendously warm reception for this genial Irishman on the occasion of the Packy Bonner testimonial match. Celtic against the Republic of Ireland with Coyne and Charlie Nicholas kicking off for Celtic. White touching the ball back. Now Darius Dobchek gives Packy Bonner his first touch of the ball in this match. So a characteristic Bonner clearance. And Craney. Another attempt by Jerry Craney. Some worries on the Irish bench about that one. Craney again. A nice touch by Nicholas Craney inside. Into the box, might try a shot. Jerry Craney makes it 1 0. Well, Steve Fulton congratulating Craney, and Nicholas had a hand in that, setting him free in the first place. Here's Kelly. Back to Shiddy. That's a good ball. Townsend. Well, Packy Bonner had to be sharp for that one. Town's end to Houghton. Houghton's on the outside. Now it's Houghton again. Try to lay off to Shiddy. Tries the shot. And Bernie Slaven gets the goal. Created all the way by Ray Houghton. And finished by Slaven. Anton Rogan, the Northern Ireland international now. Receiving close attention by Ray Houghton. There's Coyne. And Rogan. Tries the shot. It's saved by Payton. Half time. Sees the Irish attacking again. It's a good ball to Staunton. Insider, what a save by Bonner. Stopped the ball and Elliott mopped up. Well, a nasty moment for the Celtic defence there. There's Craney. And Fulton. Ended by Houghton. But Shiddy wins the ball to Houghton. Cross into the centre. And Kelly makes it 2 1 to Ireland. Well, the Celtic defence always in trouble after Fulton lost possession. Payton's big clearance now. And Niall Quinn. Picked up by Steve Fulton. Great ball by Fulton. There's Craney. It's one against one. Payton to beat, which he does. Well, what an afternoon this young Celtic striker's having. Two out of two for Craney. Now that is Jakodowski coming on for Charlie Nicholas. Polish international striker replaces the Scottish international. Rogan. Good ball forward. Peyton chests the ball down. Almost a mistake there. Jakodowski wins the corner for Celtic. And Staunton and Kelly coming off as Liam Brady and Roy Aitken come on. Two tremendously popular figures here, especially the former Celtic captain, Roy Aitken. They'll be trying to stop up the defence here. The Celtic have yet another corner. Janowski in the middle. Made it clear by Quinn. Now Brady. That's cut out fairly effectively. Derek White. On the Brady chant the Celtic fans. It's all Celtic at the moment. Anton Rogan with the cross. Payton's there. Jakonowski tries to control it. And well stopped by Payton. And there's Dennis Bonner now, brother of Pat, the Sligo Rovers player making an appearance in this testimonial match. Now Craney. Shown tremendous skill and speed all afternoon. Slips it out to Jakonowski with the cross. Fulton's header. Oh, and Frank Stapleton hits the back of his leg and the ball crosses the line. A hat trick for Jerry Craney. Well, very unfortunate for Frank Stapleton. The ball ricocheted off his ankle. And Celtic are ahead 3-2. The referee blows for full time. 
And what a tremendous feast of football we've seen between these two very entertaining sides. Final score, Celtic 3, Republic of Ireland 2. What a day for Pat Bonner and of course for his brother Dennis who's travelled from Sligo Rovers to take part as well. Well, Pat, a sensational afternoon. Beautiful afternoon. It's something that I'll treasure for the rest of my life. You can hear the crowd, magnificent supporters. And this has not been the best year we've had, but look at them now, they are just singing. They're proud of what Celtic's about. They're proud of the Irish teams coming here, put on a good display today. And we am absolutely overwhelmed. Wonderful to see so many Irish and Scots people united as one. Well, that's it, you know, this club has been founded on sort of Irish background at the very start. And now it's all come together here in this marvellous day and I'm overjoyed and I'm proud for my family up there. They're all sitting up there and enjoying and taking in every moment of it. All these years ago, back in Donegal, could you ever have envisaged something like this? No, no, I must admit. Never, but it's come true and that's what I'm so happy about at the moment. The opportunity was near for to play professional football for, for kids around here. Um, I didn't think I would get the opportunity to. It happened for me. I was very, very lucky. I had a lot of lucky breaks along the way. And uh, I've got to where I am with, with luck and with hard work. Really, since packy has been in the number one position, the team has taken off along with Jack Charlton. Uh, and you know, the European Championships, he performed brilliantly there. He performed brilliantly in the World Cup. And he's got many years ahead of him. Packy, as far as I'm concerned, epitomises the best of our club. He comes from Ireland, he comes from a, a place that we know supports us and loves us. He, he shows his appetite, he shows his love of the club, he shows his determination to succeed and to do well in ev everything that he does. Packy's always worked very hard, he's always listened. If he's had a problem, he's come to me with a problem and we've discussed it through. And, uh, but he's a good pro, he's a very good pro, he's a lovely lad, and um, he's never been one minute's problem for me since the day I met him. Certainly I feel that I, I, if I stay fit and uh, train hard, uh, train the way I should do, eat properly and so on, that I should play till another five or six years in it.